Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Anthony Plus conversation. I have with me today Question Mark. Um, hello, Question Mark. Hello. Thanks for having me on. Hi. Um, and thank you for having me on your channel because I believe this is going to be on your channel too. Yeah. I will put a link below to your channel for um, everybody, but I'm sure everyone is already familiar with it. Um, today, folks, uh, we are going to try and talk about pessimism, uh, something that uh, you know we have been whispering to each other about for some time. Um, something uh, that uh, we feel needs to be discussed uh, transparently, uh, and hopefully uh, something that uh, will lead um, us to get some kind of consensus in the antinatalist community uh, in, a, in, in a positive way. Um, so, yeah, I'll just briefly talk about ethylism. You know, ethylism, I like the word ethylism. I think the word itself is, is, uh, is quite beautiful in many ways. It's like life backwards, you know, it turns life on its head. It kind of flip-flops the way we see the world and makes us look at it a different way. I think the word itself is is, is well chosen. Um, but yeah, what is ethelism? Well, you know, unfortunately there's no book on ethelism, which I think is a huge, huge problem uh, because, you know, for it to be taken seriously, I think there needs to be a book. What, what do you think, uh, Mark? Do you, um... like, obviously we have, all, we have all these videos and stuff online. But to me, like the the message of ethelism is very, very much muddled. Okay, uh, I hear the kind of uh, people, uh, the leaders, if you like, within the kind of um, ethelist circles, uh, saying one thing and then you know saying another, backtracking, saying, for example, well, we don't want to kill anybody. Uh, we're not about murdering anybody. But then you know saying in another part of their conversation, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd happily be the executioner or, you know, for example, push a pregnant lady down the stairs or, um, or, 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 or kill one little kid to save loads of other little kids, you know. Um, there's many examples of this, this, uh, this strange phenomenon that is saying one thing <laughs> and then saying another thing that kind of uh, completely uh, displaces the original original statement. Um, yeah. Do you know what I mean, Mark? Have you witnessed that? Yeah. So before I comment on that, I do want to highlight that this happens in pretty much every movement that I've been part of. So, for example, if you take ethylism off the table and you just look at the antinatalist movement, there's discussion about forced sterilization. There's discussion about eugenics. There's, uh, well, actually, I don't think there's discussion. There's like proclaimants about it. And there's pushback about that stuff. Um, and uh, actually, I just had a conversation with Les Unite about, you know, his involvement in this whole uh, anti perocative thought umbrella. And yeah, he's seen, you know, uh, memes about dead babies and hatred of uh, children and and uh, pregnant women and, and name it. Uh, it's there. Um, I don't think we ever came to a solution. We just acknowledge that that it exists. Um, that uh, so, yeah, I, I, I have seen um, different FLS have different beliefs. And actually, uh, next month, I plan on having a panel discussion. I don't know if I've told this to you, but uh, I, pl I plan on having uh, some ethelists uh, to have a panel discussion where I can ask them about their philosophy. I feel like I have a decent understanding of it. Uh, your question about the book, I don't think we necessarily need a book. I think we need a distilled, um, agreed upon working document in a weird way uh, so for example it could be like a wikipedia it could be a a video series on what it is so for example i i'm not aware of the voluntary human extinction movement having a book i don't think they have one if they do uh, i stand you know, that's fine but um they have a website yeah. and les has given uh talks about what he believes and 
I feel like that's kind of needed is just a clear distilled version that at least the majority of the proponents agree on or some of the speaking heads uh, agree upon. And mm -hmm. I think that would definitely help um, because otherwise it'd be, it's yeah. like this nebulous thing that we can't really pinpoint and discuss. Uh, yeah. I'm just saying, I'm, uh, by book, I mean, we need some central centralized clarity on what the fuck it is. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. because uh, basically, uh, if we go to, like, for example, the Amendum channel, obviously, Amendum is, is viewed as the creator of capitalism. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, we can see much, um, you know, as I say, you know, duality going on, uh, saying one thing somewhere and then saying, and uh, the opposite elsewhere, uh, and many of his uh, supporters, his his advocates, uh, do the same. Um, so that's why, for me, uh, I, I I I I'm worried. Uh, I think that you know there needs to be clarity on what the hell it is. Um, yeah. Like I, when I came into the antinatalist community online, I was told ethelism was just about having a thought experiment. You know, it's just a thought experiment about you know the benevolent red button that if you had the opportunity would you press it and you know instantly make everything disappear um but it's much more than that <laughs> it's it, it's it's come to uh pass that you know it is much more than that it's um advocating for and indeed uh seeking <laughs> out people i believe uh to talk about means on how to end life um how to commit um omnicide basically um i've seen people object to that to word that, like, so like i think it's careful when whenever we're criticizing the philosophy to use the words that they use um i i, I know one proponent objects to omnicide but what we can do is say what do we mean by that word so some people there's multiple definitions yeah. of that but one thing that we can agree on is that it's it's an extinctionist movement that it's uh, arguing for the cessation of all sentient life. That's what I would uh, frame it as. Um, I might be wrong, and this is kind of the problem that I find is that I feel like I have a solid understanding of it, but then as soon as I like speak about it, sometimes someone will be like, "No, that's not what it is," and I'm like, "Well, you know, like I've been around for a while. Like if I what can't the, get it, <laughs> well, what? Yeah, exactly." what the fuck is it then tell me you know <laughs> tell us straight and um, so, so from my you know, understanding like, it is, is, it as, far is an as, far as, so, yeah, as far as i'm concerned it's a kind of mass primordialism in a way um now but but again like and there's argue they have many but again like right? that's that's a, a sketchy term to use man like i because i don't know if you've seen my interviews with like pro-mortalists the people use that word in different ways and even daily negativity explains it that way uh, i don't know like so like when you say pro mortalist well, this, is, about, this, this is like, why this is, why, than, we, wait, wait, this wait, is why we need one sec so pro mortalism could be the argument that it's better to cease to exist as soon as possible or it's the it's the opposite view of deprivationism, where deprivation is saying that, or annihilates uh, the annihilation account that's put forth by Benatar, where it says, it's a harm to you to cease to exist. Then the Epicureans say, it's neutral. It doesn't harm you. It's not good for you. The promortalists say, it is good for you. Um, but there's external circumstances that can mitigate or, or try to uh, say that you should continue to exist so someone could say death is a harm you don't have to be a pro mortalist you could say you could be a deprivationist you could say death is a harm but that it would be better still that that harm comes about uh to prevent even future uh suffering i i may have just made it more complicated but does that make sense right no i i i i, I understand what you're trying to say but then the question comes do you have the right to impose death on anybody else um and um to me that's the the problem with with ethelism is you know taking that uh in, into like for example if i was an ethelist which i'm not but me saying i have the right to end other people's lives because of my views okay 
uh, without their consent, that is, by the way. Uh, so it's not as if it's some kind of assisted dying thing. It, it's like not really taking into consideration uh, or viewing as important the fact that other people want to live <laughs> or other people want the species to continue. Um, so that, for me, is the, is the problem, the whole consent uh, issue here. Yeah, yeah, that uh, seems that's to be the violating, yeah. About like violating uh, people's autonomy, pretty much. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it violates their autonomy. Yeah, and, and like aside from the whole um, violation of autonomy, as you put it, I think one has got to, uh, if they are an ethnic, they have to concede the, the impracticality of, of what they're trying to um, achieve because. Obviously, they are an extremely small portion of uh, humanity. Um, and in terms of time scale here, mm. <laughs> how long before they get the popular vote if they're trying to be democratic? Well, I don't think it? they need a popular vote. Um, you just need a, a strong minority advocating for this, right? You don't yeah, need yeah. But this is my point. If, if, they, if they wanted to do it democratically, I'm saying, if they right. wanted to, if they were going to come, come at me and say, but we want to do this democratically, yeah? Right. Um, we want to secure the majority. But how much of a majority is acceptable? Like, if one person objects, should, what, why, why does you know, the rest of the humanity have, to, have the right to, to kill them? You know? um, it's, uh, these questions aren't really that well answered. I know that Imendum talked about you know, the smart people should be driving the bus. You know, that's, what his, that's his kind of uh, metaphor that he likes to, to use. Um, but is it is it <laughs> is it an example of being smart when you're pushing an impractical um, philosophy yeah. uh, that isn't going to be accepted by um, you know the powers that be uh, and and is left in the hands of you know um, a very very um, I would say. A powerless minority who, who are, are basically ineffectual and can't achieve what you want. Um, I think the counter to uh, the counter argument yeah. to that is that um, they want to start the conversation. So yeah, yeah. that's the the very basic uh, starting point. Personally, right? Yeah. My view on ethnism is that it's very interesting in terms of uh, kind of uh, putting a thought in someone's head. Yeah. Yeah. It's very powerful. Like I will say, uh, in terms of Amendum's channel, um, Amanda's work as well, uh, some of the kind of metaphors, the analogies, the allegories that they've created and imagery that they've, you know, used, the poetic language. And I was just going to say, it's kind of poetic. Of of... Um, yeah, I'm looking at Amendum's yeah. channel right now, and he has 3,869 videos on that yeah. one channel alone. Yeah. Um, so to yeah, go through yeah, the source yeah. material is quite a uh, <laughs> quite a uh, thing to undertake. Uh, that's for sure. That's yeah, why, yeah, yeah. That's why I think that's like why a distilled would... version would be helpful. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's exactly what, what what I think as well. That you know that many videos, uh, you know, it's very hard to see, especially when there's a lot of, uh, as I said, double standards going on. There's a lot of uh, Things being said that are, I, I would view as completely outrageous as well. Um, and, you know, are they a basis? Are they, are they part of ethnicism? You know? Uh, well, that's, you uh, know, that would, brings up a question. If, Can if, you if say, they are. Yeah, go ahead. If, I'm just saying, if some of these completely outrageous things are part of ethnicism, well, <laughs> I would argue it shouldn't be listened to at all because some of the things that have been said on that channel are beyond the pale. Of, of, I would argue any white-minded um, imagination <laughs> or, or mindset. Yeah. Um, but anyway, sorry, go ahead. So that, that opens up the question, and I don't know if many people can, uh, what their position is on this, whether or not you can separate the philosophy from the person. So if, uh, for example, Gary has political views that you disagree with, does that does it follow that to accept ethelism, you have to accept his political, economic, um, I don't know, whatever his other views are? Or can you can you say, well, his ethelism I agree with, 
but all his other video, uh, all the other videos, like I don't agree with. For example, and I've been using this example, and I'm kind of skeptical of whether or not it's working. Um, there's been papers by David Benatar that I disagree with, right? Um, I believe yeah. he wrote about circumcision. He wrote about corporal punishment. He wrote about other views that he has, right? I consider myself a Benatarian antinatalist, and but it doesn't there for me. It makes perfect sense. It doesn't therefore follow that I accept his other political views or his other ethical theories, right? Um, and do you think that that can be applied to aphorism, or what do you think? I think I think that's kind of um, what you know people should do in in general is remove the personality from the um, the idea, if you like, and talk about the ideas. But the problem is, as I said, there's no that standardized text on it. There's no centralized version of ethnism. And all we've got is, you know, thousands of videos where you have to try and go through them and glean, you know, the message. Yep. And, you know, some of that message is, is very, very distasteful indeed. I mean, um, for example, there's a recurring theme of, uh, you know, very, very... <laughs> disparaging statements being made about poor people, which I find you know, highly offensive. And now, obviously, yeah, being offensive doesn't mean, you know, <laughs> that they're wrong. But I would argue that there's much evidence to conclude that poor people can and do add value in this world. I mean, you know, some of the greatest, um, what we would deem geniuses, polymaths, uh, have, have, have died penniless, yeah. um, from scientists to artists to political activists. I mean. Well, I want to like we, we read. I mean, the, the, yeah, the I, wouldn't want, I don't want, want people to be book. poor. I wouldn't want people to be poor, but like I wouldn't hate them or I wouldn't uh, say disparaging things about poor people. I'd want to uh, work no. towards uplifting people out of poverty. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, no, my, my, my point is that, um, yeah, exactly. I agree that we need to lift people out of poverty. Poverty is harmful to the individual. Yeah. Uh, but to kind of paint, poor people as uh, subhuman uh, or, you know, in any way, lesser being than other human beings. I think that's a very, very dangerous language. Because um, as I said, like, there's been there's so many examples of poor people who've done amazing things for the world. As I said, Gutenberg, the guy who created the printing press in, in, in Germany, that man died fucking penniless. <laughs> and you could argue he's, like, the reason, he's, he's been the conduit that has allowed knowledge to you know uh go around the world and and, and, and improve life um there's other examples i mean artists van gogh um oscar wilde uh you know even socrates apparently died <laughs> in poverty um diogenes and you know the other point is not not all work van gogh was is, also is paid yeah yeah van gogh yes yeah. so i said van gogh that's just uh dialectical issue <laughs> um you know um not all work often work is necessary but through no fault of the employee um the work is not financially well paid yeah. i mean we i talk about teachers and nurses and in, in my part of the world they're not paid remarkably well they can't afford to live in the swanky parts of town um and some of them are struggling financially um and then you have to also realize that not only is uh, necessary work often not paid very well, um, but not all work is paid. Not all work that is beneficial to society is paid. I mean, there are people who take it upon themselves to do the hard slog, for example, some kind of volunteering or some kind of uh, action that is beneficial to society, and it's not well paid. And those people are doing it outside of the whole paradigm or you know the, the whole area of, of, of financial um you know motive um, and they can be poor people but yet they're adding value to the world so to say that poor people <laughs> are, are you know are pieces of shit or whatever or you know they're the problem i think is is not very it's, it's, it's an infantile way of looking at it um but the poor people are the problem uh the system is the problem uh, the system that allows inequality and to say poor people are the problem, you're by default kind of saying, you know, uh, people should be measured by their uh, financial, um, you know, <laughs> stature. And we all know, we all know 
that in this world, the ruthless, the psychopathic, the Machiavellian, the narcissist, they can rise to the top in this um, society that we've got worldwide. The deceptive, the selfish, these are the people that can get to the top, the backstabbers, the self-interested, um, you know, overly self-interested. And they can do so by often heinous manners, uh, heinous actions. And um, to say that, you know, those people are better than <laughs> the poor, I think that's a fucking joke. Mm. And uh, anyway, I've, I've, uh, I've rambled on there. Okay. So um, <laughs> what do you think? Uh, would you like to add anything to, to that? Well, uh, yeah, I, I haven't, I don't recall the specifics of those comments, but I know that there was um, quite uh, disgusting comments about uh, pregnant women and stuff like that. And those things I would reject outright. And I wouldn't want that, like, I'd say that's um, negative to the conversation. Um, but I've, again, like I, I've talked to a lot of ephilists and I think you can separate those comments from the philosophy, um, because they self-report that they say it themselves. They're, they're like, yeah, we, we, um, I, I remember I was talking to an ephilist the other day and he said he saw like two videos by a just two. And I think uh, the interview with Laith Malik Green, like the the group that he starts, uh, that Facebook page, um, I forgot how many people, but it's like thousands of people on that page. The majority of them don't even know, um, you know, some of the comments that were made by Gary in that regard. I think what what it is is that if Gary says something about ephelism, you take his word for that. But what he says outside of ephelism, I think you can you can hash that out on yourself. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Um, you know, he, he, let's put, to put it like um, politely, he hasn't exactly read the book on how to win friends and influence people, you know. Mm, and uh, I don't good. mean to I be uh, rude. I don't mean to be rude, but... Um, I don't know, some people like... The guy, as I said, he, he's done some... He's done some amazing work in terms of his metaphors and his passion. And I, I do believe there's a, we are multifaceted beings. And I believe there's a huge part of him that does care about suffering. I'm not going to knock him for that. And I know the man is quite open about his suffering um, as, 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 as he, he, he has spoken about uh, certain issues he has. Um, and I, I really you know, think that's, that, is a, that, that is, as I said, we're multifaceted. And that facet of him is, is great and wonderful. Um, but there are other parts to him, and I just wonder about what is the message here? What is going on? What will be in Emendon's, um, I don't want to say mind camp, but what will be in his, his book on ethelism? Um, what, what would he put in there as the kind of modus operandi? How is he going to get his end goal? What is he going to suggest needs to be done in society mm. to get to that, um, you know, theoretical red button the pushing off that red button that's the worry i have as well is, is like what is he willing to do or have like what is he willing to suggest should happen to people like the poor like the vulnerable like the disabled because let's not let's not stop at poor people there's been uh, remarks about disabled people i mean he's like there has often been uh, you know when he does um what do you call it rebuttals or attempts rebuttals of other people's videos he has commented on them you know calling them the R word or, you know, saying they look a certain way uh, in terms of looking as if they have a certain disability. I mean, this is quite, quite common parlance on his uh, channel. So if that's his level of empathy <laughs> for other people, that's, that's strange because this is a man who cries out that, you know, he wants to end suffering, <laughs> okay? But yet he seems to be spewing forth uh, a hell of a lot of um, words that cause suffering. And that's why I go back to the fact that this, this man, if, if he believes so strongly in what he's saying, which I, I believe he does, because you, know, you don't make that many videos without having, a, I would say, a firm belief in, in what he's saying. Um, why the hell you know, is he so, um, why, 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 why is he so um, poor at uh, winning people over? I mean, 
in a way, it's probably good that he's been himself. I don't think people should be deceptive and you know put on a faux display of who they are just to win people over. But unfortunately, I think the nails in, in the coffin with with much of what he said, unless unless he can concede that he was wrong to say certain things, or he can admit that certain things were said. Uh, you know, maybe he spoke too fast, and he, you know, on reflection, he can take take it back or or something like that. But does he have that capability in him? <laughs> Do you think he does? Um, I've heard that he has made videos in response to criticisms of things he said. Uh, I've heard that. Um, I don't know if they're satisfactory or not. I mean, he spends a lot of his well, time responding, right? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. He does, but um, oftentimes it's, uh, you know, he, he gets very angry. And I appreciate if he's, he's emotionally involved in this. But uh, again, unfortunately, I think anger clouds our judgment. You know, it makes it kind of, uh, it makes it a kind of, uh, you know, battle, if you like, rather than adults having a sensible conversation. Well, that's if I mean, you val- well, th- here's the thing. Like, that's if you value civil dialogue over uh, this type of uh, emotionally re- laden um, reaction type of uh, rhetoric. Which, um, so for example, you said, uh, you know, how how effective would he be, um, or you're, like something like that. Like when I look at his videos, they get like thousands of views. So like. Um, let me see. I'm actually going to look at some of it. Obviously, he has an audience. I've watched them before. Uh, like, okay, yeah, yeah. This, I, I've, this been in the past I've been one, in the past one, two, four, five, six, six videos 2.7 thousand in one video, 2.5 thousand, 2.1 thousand, 2.6 thousand, 2.6 thousand. He's doing better than uh, a lot of uh, you know what we're doing. Um, so yeah, even though uh, like my method of conversation obviously is to keep it civil um and to have good faith dialogue without shouting people down or or swearing at them or uh these types of things Mm. i think the internet or the way youtube works it kind of rewards this type of um i don't even know what to call it like this type of polarizing view well look put it um, this way they malik reem, it, but it's well, not one, sec, make one, it. Uh, one second yeah. so uh Lath malik reem for example compared gary to gary urofsky are you familiar with his work um not particularly no i've heard the name but, yeah, so i'm not trying to pull a what aboutism but what i'm trying to highlight is that uh these type of individuals tend to have a large following so uh gary yarofsky is an example of a person who if you if you go if you you youtube some of the stuff he says um it's quite uh quite bold i'll put it that way it's quite bold for vegan stuff i mean if you if you think about the stereotype of the vegan right um we tend to have a negative stereotype because we're so uh emboldened by some of the rhetoric by, say, PETA and Gary Yarovsky and certain talking head figures like that. Um, and I don't know, like, as, as personally for me, I don't like it. Uh, I don't think it's conducive to trying to figure out, like, I, if I sit down with you and you start swearing at me and you start calling me a murderer and stuff like that, I'm not going to be able to have a good faith dialogue with you. But if people just want to win points that way, or they think it's useful as a rhetorical tool for their cause, maybe that's, uh, you know, that's their prerogative. But that's why um, I consider the type of dialogues that I have different. Um, but I can't say one is better than the other in terms of like audience, because my audience is fucking small, man. <clears throat> like, well, the truth is, the truth is, in the great scheme of, in, in, in the, it, listen, yeah, in the great scheme of things, uh, the F list audience is extremely small. <laughs> it's it's micro, you know, it, it's it's tiny. Okay, yeah. uh, and to bring it to the mainstream, if you really want, if you really think, you know, uh, shouting and you know, you know, calling people horrible names is going to do that. Um, 
Well, the, you know, it can so do it. I'm this. not going to lie. Hey, 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 one sec. Sorry, I'm interrupting you so much, but I really want to try and distill some of these points. Can I just say something? Can I just say something? I just say something. It's not necessarily about shouting, calling people names. I mean, you know, there is a time and place for that, but it's just about certain things that have been said. That's yeah. my issue. Like, I'll go into it in a moment, but I had a huge issue with the benign rape comment, the, the dreaded benign, benign rape comment. But go, I'll talk about that in a moment. Go ahead. So I was just going to say, like, do you think that uh, PETA, for example, do you think that they're popular? Because they've, they've used uh, um, really bad rhetoric. Yeah, but you know, can you give me one example of some of the stuff they've done? Like, as far as I'm, I've, as far as I'm aware, most of it is like they kind of do the kind of reverse psychology of you know, you know, putting the human in in a position where they have to imagine being the animal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as far as I'm aware, they haven't really you know seriously advocated for you know killing everybody or. Yeah, well, no, what, no, no. what have they said? Would you? Well, say? I'm just saying, like yeah. some of the words that they use and some of the rhetorical devices is uh, divisive within the animal rights community. However, I see them as like so, like they use Holocaust as like a comparative state, where philosophically you can say, well, there's a mass killing being taken place, but you're not taking into account the historical and the social context in which that word's being used. And also, um, some people will say that the objectification or the supposed objectification of using uh, women to put forth this message can also be a harm. And also, um, the whole blaming uh, people for these choices, it's kind of like you're not really, it's like you're trying to fight people instead of trying to convince people. And that is, in my view, uh, problematic because a lot of the vegans that I know um, do not like PETA, but acknowledge that they're a significant um, player in the whole animal rights world. Now you have like people yeah. like you have it organizations is, it, like Mercy for Animals and stuff like that that take a different approach. And uh, but I can't say I even though I disagree with PETA, I can't say that they're not a significant impact. When I look at uh, it is yes the videos of David Benatar and and meant him. I can't say Gary is doesn't have a significant impact. Um, so like I'm just skeptical on that. Now will it take well like. like you know, mainstream, maybe. You know, Bennett, Benatar, Benatar, I don't even know if Benatar knew who he was uh, until, you know, he was reached out to by uh, Amanda. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to compare Amendum to Peter, like, I, I don't know if it's a good, uh, you know, comparison. I don't think... Uh, like a I don't false know get, you know, yeah. yeah, I yes. think so. I don't think we're going to get Amendum billboards around the world um, or, or on the sides of buses or no but he might be the person that sparks like other things yeah um, but th th that 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 is a that is something i was just thinking about there there is this thing about you know you get one idea like this playing this idea that's kind of like this shared kind of um agreement on certain issues and then there's levels of extremity on on, on that line in terms of people's uh, you know views on how to attain something like me personally um, I don't want people to have children. Okay? That's that's the only thing. I, I I don't think it's good for people to bring people into the world, um, uh, because personally, I think it's too much of a risk. It is a gamble with someone else's life. And there's no consent there, and it's just you know I just find it ter a terrible thing to do, considering all the harm that can come their way, and they will die. Um, but you know, obviously, a lot of ethicists will will think think that as well. But you know, their way of um, you know, they want to deal with it in a different way than me. Um, but, you know, I just think that what you raise is an in interesting point. I and mean, like, it, is, it is true that there are kind of outliers, if you like, in, in, in the world on, on different matters, extremists, I suppose. Well, that's what and the parallel that I was trying effect. to highlight is that in yeah. every movement, there's yeah, yeah, more yeah. extreme advocates. That's what I was trying to get at. Well, there is this, there is this interesting idea that... Um, as movements get bigger, they become more moderate, okay, which is interesting. I, I believe that's kind of a, uh, a phenomenon that, you know, the ethics community is very small, but as more and, people's, more and more people's eyes turn, turn towards it, say online and stuff, you get a lot more people picking up on, you know, perhaps 
things that aren't great about it and they might want to you know moderate it a bit and, and make it more palatable for the masses uh, but i don't know how you could do that with epilism but you know i i do think that as, as, a, as, a, as an idea grows it is challenged more and more as, as it grows in popularity or as it grows in like a, people's awareness of it it is challenged more and more um i, I would hope so anyway <laughs> in this day and age um it's, you know that it's, it, it's open to more um you know intellectual attack so the fact that it's kind of a hidden away in the dark corners of the internet you know it hasn't been fully opened up yet uh, if, if ever it will um so yeah that's kind of all i have to say there back to the the but, definition of ephelism my understanding of it so that people who may not be familiar with it and I might be wrong, and this is why I'm going to have a conversation forward uh, about it with other ephelists, is it's a school of thought that, that makes a descriptive argument and a prescriptive argument. So the description is that the problem is this DNA that uh, it perpetuates this cycle of, of consumption, reproduction. Oh, I forgot the rest of the acronym. <laughs> it's like crap, right? Like. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you know what the acronym is? I can't remember, but yeah, yeah, I, I do. I do remember that being the, the acronym. Yeah. Yeah. Some so, like, it's it's a description of nature, and then also, I think one of historically one of the reasons why it was created was that a lot of the narrative within antinatalism communities was human centric, and it wasn't taking into account other sentient creatures. And I think that's yeah. one of the motivating factors for creating it. So it's sentiocentric or sentientist uh, uh, antinatalism. It incorporates all sentient life. It makes a description about mm -hmm. life, and it's um, uh, it's it, it talks a lot about, uh, or I'd say one of the th things about it is it's determinism. So they're um, they make a claim on free will as well. So, and then well, I, talk I, I, about I agree well, that the red button thing historically has been part of the narrative of negative utilitarianism. So we have we have a recipe of different schools of thought within this framework, and I think those four things are part of it. Um, that's my understanding for now, but. Obviously, I'll, I'll probably learn more with more discussions, but that's been my understanding. Do yeah. You, do you think that my analysis is wrong, or what do you think? No, I think that's uh, fair enough. Um, okay. I do. I do. Uh, yeah, I do think that's fair enough. Um, I. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to talk about the I, I mentioned earlier benign rape thing, um, and yeah. I know that a lot a lot of argument was had about that. I suppose I should. I like to think about things for as long as I can because, you know, <laughs> I don't want to. I just want to give it due diligence as best I can, um, as best I can with my limited processing power. But you know, I question whether any rape can ever be benign, um, even even if they're talking about it as a kind of you know the effects of it being benign. Um, you know. I, I, I think you've got to appreciate that this is it, when any man jumps on a woman without her consent, puts his penis in, inside her orifices without her consent. And um, the truth is, it's, 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 it's the action we've got to condemn. Okay, the action is that 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 rape is never benign because he, he set out and he did not have any regard uh, for whether she uh, number one was going to consent to it, and he did not care. Either, let's be honest, he did not care about the after effects or the possible consequences of what he was doing. Um, and, you know, so yeah, there may have been circumstances in the past where a man did it and the psychological impact on the woman uh, wasn't so bad. But the truth is, the rape itself can never be benign because he can never ever know. The man who does it can never know whether that will be the case. In fact, you know, History and uh, much uh, like 99.9999% of the uh, you know anecdotal evidence is otherwise that it is harmful to the woman, and I don't think we could ever um, 
therefore justifiably call any rape benign because uh, it is always the case that the man um, has done something wrong in my eyes. He's done something where he has shown disregard for uh, the person, uh, the victim, and in a way he was never to know what that person was was going to be like in terms of how they were going to take it. You know, uh, the impact could have gone totally wrong. Um, it, it could, they could have ended up uh, mentally ill, suicide, or whatever. You know, there, there's so many terrible things that can happen. It's a trauma. So, to uh, I, I just think it's poor use. It's trauma, exactly. And like you know, personally, I know women who've been raped. Okay, and um, I've seen the effect on them. Uh, you know, I, I've seen the effect on people who've suffered child abuse. I've seen the effect on uh, women who've been who've been raped. And you know, we we do need to be fucking careful about how we talk about certain things um, in the public arena. Okay, and I think this is one area uh, where Emendem should have just stepped back and said, look, I said the wrong fucking thing. Um, and I, I know he made an attempt to do that, but did he go far enough? Um, you know, there's no point in trying to argue in terms of logic because we're not just <laughs> we're not just rational beings, we're emotive beings, okay? Um, and you do have to make allowances for that in your speech and in, in, in your words. You have to think about the consequences of what you're saying. Because um, at the end of the day, if he's trying to win people over to his points of view, he does need to take their emotional side into, into um, well, I would say into, you know, his thoughts himself. Uh, so, you know, I, I, and the other thing that he said that was very controversial was about, you know, pushing a pregnant woman down the stairs. So, for example, he, he, I think he, well, he did say, he said that if he said to a woman, you know, if you have, if you get pregnant, okay, and you, you want to have that baby, I'm going to push you down the stairs, okay? And uh, he said he would be, um, you know, that's a legitimate thing that he, he could do that because in his words, there was a contract between them both. I mean, he said there was a contractual agreement that if they had sex and the woman fell pregnant and she wasn't, she didn't want to get an abortion, he would kill the bitch, as I, I think were his words. Um, like that doesn't make sense from the start because, you know, <laughs> I've never heard of uh, uh, a contract that was... Uh, legally enforceable <laughs> when the contract itself was fucking illegal um as far as i'm aware in, in every part of the world <laughs> it's illegal <laughs> to kill somebody um to murder somebody yeah uh it's illegal to murder somebody so you can't have a fucking contract you know that's uh defendable in any court <laughs> that's that that uh that's terms had, had murder as one of the outcomes. Uh, so again, that's a, a stupid argument. Um, and, you know, a man, I, I'm a man, you're a man, men have to take responsibility for their actions. I know I've got this weapon of mass destruction, okay, this penis, and men have to realize if you dip your wick, okay, <laughs> you know, you can get caught up in a moment and, you know, oh yeah, put it in raw, yeah. And, you know, you both can be off a mindset that you don't want to have children, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, human beings are fragile, vulnerable, you know, biological organisms. And we're um, manipulated by emotions and uh, we're manipulated by, you know, hormones, chemicals in our body. And, you know, one must be aware that when a woman becomes pregnant, okay, and if, you, if, you're, if you're a party to that, if you are... A man who who who, who um, you know deposited the seed. Well, you really should uh, you know realize that when a woman finds out she's pregnant, her mind can change because you you impose on her, as it were, a a, a dilemma. Okay, um, certain women will get worried because they might get you know sentimental about this thing growing in them and view it as a a life, an entity that deserves. You know, respect for its own autonomy. Like they're not, they don't want to kill it, as it were, because they respect it as an individual that has rights. But these things can come into play in a human mind. I mean, they <laughs> emotions are very complex things. And then there's also maternal chemicals, hormones that you know the body naturally spews out when a woman becomes pregnant, and they make her maternal, caring, and think about you know this baby perhaps in a, or this future baby in a different way. So. It's all going against, you know, 
<laughs> what 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 they may have uh, agreed beforehand. So, you know, when you're aware of that, you, as a man, you've got to take responsibility. You put your penis in them. Okay, you came. Okay, and if if that woman changes her mind, well, I'm afraid that's tough shitty. <laughs> and uh, you know, you have no right to kill her uh, because it's your fault. Okay, you've um, created that situation, so you you've got to suck it up and uh, look after her and by god look after that child if it's born um yeah that's where i stand on that yeah same no like I think you? it's yeah i think uh you uh didn't take the necessary precautions and uh you faced the consequences of uh that irresponsibility so yeah um yeah i, <laughs> I don't uh, i don't have um, as many words as you, the um yeah i think well that, you know not <laughs> i think yeah like if if you don't, you don't take necessarily uh, the necessary steps to prevent pregnancy then that's on you if you uh if you, you know uh, someone does procreate and uh, you you face that uh, that consequence and that responsibility um yeah 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 uh, um so going forward then uh where do you see yourself so you're going to enter into dialogue with these specialists and try and get them to clarify matters. Do you feel there's a need to do that? Obviously, you do because you're doing it. Um, <laughs> and is, well, is it for? <laughs> well, okay. So, so what, what are you hoping to achieve? You're, you're, hope, you're hoping they they come to some kind of uh, transparency on the issue and, and they clarify. Well, I've heard a lot. Okay, well, I've heard a lot of people say that we want to have the conversation. So I'm like, cool, let's have it. And uh, one thing that I want that I would hope for um, having conversations about ephilism with ephilists is, yeah, points of clarity, uh, trying to say, okay, well, what do you specifically believe is ephilism? What do you believe yourself? And how do you feel about other ephilists? Or how do you feel about other um, formulations of ephilism? I want to see that talked about. Um, I feel like, mm. uh, I think my description of ephilism is pretty accurate. I want to have someone critique me on it, whether or not it's wrong or right. And I want to, yeah. what, what, I, what I really like to find out is to have a solid understanding of what it is so that, um, well, I mean, like that's, that's what I do with these conversations anyways, just try and figure out what the heck people are believing. It's like yeah. a type of street epistemology. I just want to, I want to know what people know, how they come to that knowledge and um, try and come to a place of understanding that's really my goal mm. is um mm -hmm. if someone makes an argument my point isn't to uh try and win points is trying to understand what the heck they're arguing and offer my alternative right. view and what are points of agreement what are points of disagreement so for example the the biggest um agreement that myself and so i let me let me make it clear because because I feel like we've been clear, but maybe not um, for me. I am not an ephilist. All right. Clip that if you need it. Um, I do not. I, um, and I will also say, I am not an ephilist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We cleared that up. I, I hope we made it clear. So um, with that said, there are things that we agree on. So for example, moral consideration of sentient life, of non-human sentient life. That's something we agree on. Sentiocentric antinatalism. Now, how does that come about in practice? That's, that's a different topic, right? Like, um, I think it's a harm that other sentient creatures are created into existence, but it isn't therefore follow that uh, we do, like I'd be in favor of culling animals or, or whatever, um, or that the, moral responsibility would be different. For example, wild animals creating more animals, I think it is a harm that they're created, but I don't think that they're morally responsible. So there's a difference between moral patience and moral agents. And I think when it comes to moral agency, us as humans have that. And that when it comes to the practicalities of it, 
we should not be um, unnecessarily creating other sentient life into existence. So that's where I think there's a, a point of agreement. Also, this is yeah. pro- this is provisional. Just one sec. Uh, so this is provisional on my my view of free will, but I'm a hard determinist. So there tends to be two things that we're there's we're agreeing on so far. I used to be a negative utilitarian. I'm skeptical of it now, but that was like I do put more weight on suffering than on uh, happiness or well-being when I'm doing these calculations of of what is moral and what is not. That tends to be a similarity as well, well, that suffering is weighed more heavily um, in whatever calculation you want to make. So this is why I feel like uh, there are there are conversations that can be had between the different schools of thought. And um, yeah, I just want to hash it out and uh, mm. yeah, yeah, figure it out at that point. Yeah. Um, I think that's uh yeah, that's good that you gave your kind of the commonalities that, that, you know, you, you find important as well. I mean, it's good that there is common ground that you can start with being, you're not totally, uh, they're not totally um, aliens to you. Um, Personally, yeah, I, I take uh, suffering seriously as well. I think that you know, I think suffering, the reduction of suffering, is is is, is more important than um, you know the pleasure in the world. And I think suffering, yeah, suffering is more important to me. I take it more seriously than you know the pleasure in the world. Um, and yeah, I am also a feminist, a hard determinist, um, and uh, that's one of the reasons I'm. And antinatalism. I don't think uh, everybody's coming to this with uh, an equal shot, as it were. And you know, once you're born, you you can't escape what fate has in you know in, in play for you. And none of it is your fault. You're at the mercy of your genetics, your environment. And uh, unfortunately, if you get dealt bad cards, well, I'm afraid that's you, buddy. Um, so yeah other than that uh, my problem with ethicism is is the is, is the consent and uh, and, and uh, you know any one individual saying they have the right to end the lives of other homo sapiens now it is interesting um unfortunately one of my kind of uh, <laughs> one of one of the kind of uh, bits of grizzle that I see that word but one of the intellectual uh you know things that I have to try and you know chew a bit uh, is 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 the fact that um, do I feel the same way about animals? Now I am vegan. I care very much about animals. Um, I hate animal suffering. Um, and personally, uh, I, I extend my antinatalism into animals. I don't think that humans should breed animals. Okay, and I view uh, the suffering inherent in in the wild as as an absolute abomination. It's absolutely terrifying. It's, it just it's horrifying i mean you know some of these animals we are you know genetically very closely related to like for example chimpanzees so you know we can we have the same you know body structures more or less the mammalian digestive system the brain the you know it's more or less it's very similar um in layout so we can conclude that you know their way of uh, perceiving the world their way of feeling is somewhat similar to us as well, or indeed very similar to us. And and to think that um, you know they're going around suffering. You know, if you look at the chimpanzee world, for example, the the, the, the amount of uh, uh, murders in that community, the amount of um, you know extreme violence, uh, chimpanzees getting their limbs ripped off, you know, their their, their, their cheeks bitten off, whatever. Um, it's horrifying, and I don't have to go into too much of the, the suffering in the world because we all know about that. We talk about it all the time. So it, it's a weird one. Like I, I personally, if, if ideally, this is where I'd be on it. If we could get humans to stop procreating uh, by, you know, on, uh, the um, consensus that it's wrong to procreate, and people, you know, chose not to have children. Okay, that would be brilliant for me but then we'd have to deal with the animals and how would we do that well that's the issue for me maybe some kind of um extinguishment of, of life in that way uh, might be acceptable in my eyes 
uh, as long as it was painful and um, you know, it didn't hurt uh, the animal. Um, so, Goodness. for example, the last human to die, the last human to die, again, this is all hypothetical, it's not going to happen like this, unfortunately, but if humans agreed not to breathe, okay, and then it came down to like you know, the last generation, and then it came down to the last 10 people, and they all agreed, like, you know, the last one, you know, presses the button to kill the animals or something, or, or they, <laughs> they go to like the International Space Station and do it from there or something. Um, would I be okay with that? Uh, as in like extinguishing animals as long as it was pain, painless and, and instantaneous? Uh, yes. And now this is the issue here because why am I being specious? Why am I, why am I um, distinguishing or, or putting some kind of uh, line between the rights of animals to their economy and, and, and the rights to humans? Um, and that, that, that therein lies <laughs> the, 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 uh, the, the intellectual you know, grappling that I have to, uh, to justify that. And I would say it goes down to moral agency and being able to decide what is right and what is, what is wrong and to act on behalf of animals who can't do that for themselves. Um, and I think more or less you said the same thing in, 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 a, in a more eloquent manner. Is that right? Kind of earlier. It, you didn't exactly talk about the, the end, but you, you did talk about kind of uh, humans having... Um, uh, you know, moral agency yeah, and yeah. the ability to, you know, yeah. So where would you, where, like, hypothetically, given what I just said, if humans agreed not to breed and it was, you know, peacefully done and everybody you know, held hands and, you know, walked off into the sunset and, and you know, there's only a few humans left and they agreed to um, uh, deal with the animals, how, how, would, would you be okay with that? With what? With, say, for example, <laughs> Um, the last remaining humans ending all animal life or making the earth inhabitable for, 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 for you know, life ever again. Would you be okay with that? No. Um, um, so you're saying... No, I don't sorry. think we should. Ha I, I think it needs to ha we need to have a conversation about that if the day and time comes where we have to worry about... Uh, like, if if literally this happens... All of us accept voluntary human extinction, voluntary. And then the last, what, yeah. people or whatever, they're like, what are we going to do about wild animals? Suffering? Then I would say. That, 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 that's what I'm talking about. And I would say, have, have a good argument and have a good philosophy. And I'll be part of that conversation. But I can't just say if hypothetically in a, in a world where this will likely not happen, um, you know, like this would be okay. I can't say it's okay. I have to know what is your normative ethic that you're going to work with. What is the proper argument? What is our moral um, responsibilities at that time? Because animal ethics is is ever evolving. So if this is in 50 years or 100 years, how do we view other sentient creatures and our responsibilities to them? And what is the political philosophy behind it? And I just would like nuance uh, to be hashed out and uh, someone to present a, a more complex, uh, someone to address the complexity of the whole situation. Because if you, if you uh, another thing is like, if life reemerges to suffer even more, how do I know that that's not going to happen? What is, what is the guarantee? Um, and is it a harm that they are, you know, they're euthanized or whatever, whatever solution people are arguing. Um, I want to, I want to explore that more. So I'm not, I'm not going to be put into a position sure. where I'm like, yes or no. I think uh, I was talking yeah. to. Yeah, and there are, there are, there are other, there, there are other possibilities. Like, why are we thinking about that when we could be thinking about some kind of, uh, you know, approach where you know, uh, biotechnology or computers works towards you know relieving the suffering in the animal kingdom as well yeah um which is you know <laughs> possible i don't know how the hell that would happen um you know but you know these things are also on the table i suppose as, as possibilities one thing future. that i'd like so to normalize AI, we... is one thing yeah. that i'd like to yeah. normalize in ethical uh conversations is that it's okay to say i don't know 
and to continue to have that conversation and that discussion instead of trying to take sides yeah. just based on your emotional impulse. Yeah. Take a step back. Yeah. Let's have it's, a conversation. It's, 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 and it's okay. okay. Like, it is interesting and it's a, it's a very difficult thing to get over. Um, but, you know, and it's an evolutionary thing. We're, 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 out, we're competing with each other and humans will just never admit when they're wrong sometimes and they'll die on their sword, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's a shame really, but I don't think, I don't know how we'll ever get around that or, you know, make, make it look attractive for people to you know, say sorry or to, to admit, you know, I was an idiot or, you know, I, I said the wrong thing or whatever. I, I, I just think that we, we also need to, to push that and, and not mock people like for saying sorry. You know, I think, I think it's a fantastic thing if someone says sorry or, you know, um, yeah. uh, admit they were wrong. Because yeah, we are all only human and we're, we're like, I'm a determinist as well. So I, I realize that, you know, there's no, there's no real point in really, you know, <laughs> mocking people for things because it's not their fault. You know, it, 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 it is like uh, it needs, people need to be illuminated and shown their ways if, if they're harmful to others and, and themselves. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, uh, we're all victim to the data in our head. And, um, you know, our own psychologies and, you know, environmental factors that weren't of our choosing. So the little bit, the softy in me, the empath, empath in me doesn't even want to, like, you know, say disparaging things about people ever, really. I, I, I find it hard even to say about some of the stuff, in, like, I find it hard to say about Mendon because at the end of the day, he's a human being. And I understand that he's a human being who, because of no fault of his own, uh, kind of came to his world view. Um, and even though I don't agree with it, I understand that there's factors, basically it was outside of his control that he came to it. Um, but yeah, I, I still think there's a place for kind of a battle of deterministic will, if you like, and for, for, for the other deterministic robots to point out the flaws in, in, his, <laughs> in his deterministic thought. Um, but it is strange and it's weird. And yeah, we are all only human. I just want to say thank you. Yeah, it's good for people to say, to be able to admit that they don't know or they're not sure. Yeah, yeah. And also, yeah, I implore people to feel free to stand up and say, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. Because at the end of the day, we're emotional beings or sometimes we say shit without the full, emo without the full knowledge of what's happening or we have our own biases. Um, it's all only natural, unfortunately. Um, so if we can accept that, um, I think we'll be doing something good. And um, yeah, good point, Mark. Ayo, do you feel in this conversation, because uh, I kind of have to wrap up soon. Um, I, have, I have another <laughs> couple of things I have to do today. Um, is there anything that you'd like to address or comment on or any other thoughts on aphilism or the founder of aphilism that you feel like we haven't talked about? Is there um, anything no, uh, I, 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 I think that uh, you know the truth is none of us are um, none of us are God, you know, none of us are, you know we should be beyond the pale in terms of uh, being spoken about or being critiqued. I welcome it, you know. I know that uh, I'm not, uh, you know, a major mover and shaker, um, but I do welcome. Um, critique and I know that you know sometimes I get it <laughs> and yeah sometimes um, I think people are right you know uh, in, in what they say about me uh, I, 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 I hope that I haven't I, I, I honestly I, I apologize if um, I've hurt um, the mentor <laughs> uh, but honestly um, I think that it calls what he said uh, called called for uh, words to be said and i hope that in my willingness to uh think about his feelings i hope that he uh finds the heart to think about the feelings of others in the future and you know you look at superhuman dance for example him and Mendon sometimes behave like two cheeks off the one ass i mean they're both uh espoused they're both talking about ending suffering but 
they can be so very bloody mean to others. Um, and I just uh, question why that is. And I ask them both to take a serious look in the mirror and ask uh, themselves, uh, is this the way I should be behaving? Uh, is this uh, the man I want to be? Uh, am I a paragon of virtue? Am I um, lighting the way for others? Um, and I'll leave it up to them to answer that question. So yeah, that's my kind of closing remark. I want to say thank you, Mark, for uh, I have a question, though. chatting to me. Um, wait, wait, Hale, I have. A oh question. no! Oh yeah. no! Oh, so no. I want. I, so, like you, there's been people who asked me, "What is my stance on this?" And what is my stance on Ethelism? What is my stance on Gary? Do you think that I've addressed all of this in this conversation, or do you have any doubts? Do you have any any lingering? Uh, Anything lingering that you'd like uh, yeah. think that I, I need to talk I about? The, the, yeah. the, the issue is, the issue is, uh, well, and this is, this is if you want to um, answer this one, the issue is uh, you're going to talk to these athletes. Do you think you should be giving them a platform to talk on? Um, that is the issue. Uh, can, can, can you answer that one? Uh, I, I have my own opinions on it, and maybe I'll talk afterwards, but. This is the question um, people have asked before, and this is the kind of the whispering in the corridors. Okay. As so, an antinatist, as someone caring, compassionate, should you be working with these people? Should you even be talking to them in a public um, sphere? Fair. That's a fair question. I want to ask um, rhetorically about this as an answer. Do you think that as a person who is interested in philosophy, argument, counter-argument, exploring different ideas, that I shouldn't platform people that I disagree with. For example, pro-mortalists, Christians, gender-critical feminists. Um, do you think that I shouldn't have those conversations with people that I very much disagree with? I had a conversation with someone who is against uh, uh, an amendment to the right, uh, the, the right to physician-assisted suicide in Canada. I had that on my channel, right? I 100% disagree with that. I understand some of the concerns based on disability and stuff like that. However, I had that conversation. I had a Christian theologian who disagrees with me on a lot of things ethically on the channel. Right. And again, I think the conversation I had with Daily Negativity, I put oh, yeah. it as, as, wait, 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 one yeah. second. 18 plus, I put that conversation, right? I thought it was you know, very you have to be very careful having these conversations. I acknowledge that. Yeah. Do I think that there's utility, there's positive utility in discussing what I view, uh, sentiocentric antinatalism, negative utilitarianism, mixed in with determinism? I think there is philosophical utility in having these conversations, even if it's just that we just can't meet halfway, that they're 100% in disagreement with me, and I'm in 100% disagreement with them. I think there's value in hashing that out. Yeah, and I mean, personally, you put up a good argument, and I, I agree with you that you, know, you do need to have conversations with people you don't agree with. I mean, that's how we kind of, uh, <laughs> that's how we get the kind of, uh, you know, the, the popular consensus. That's how we get people on our side. And if we didn't talk to them, well, maybe they'd be, talking to others and getting away with saying whatever the hell they wanted and attracting new minds and uh, it, to their argument, okay, without you know, the other side being shown and, 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 and the frailties and, you know, the inadequacies of their argument being shown. I think that'd be a dangerous world if we didn't have the ability to compare and contrast, in a, in, you know, in a transparent manner, uh, other ideas, um, because it would lead to people being manipulated and vulnerable people vulnerable people being led astray, you know. Um, so, yeah, no, I agree with you on that base. Um, the question is, though, so the question, that question's been answered. Yes, I think it's good if we talk to others with opposing viewpoints. I think that's uh, a social good. Um, the question is, should you be working with Ethelis? Because I know that you work with Amanda on the podcast. Um, okay, so she yeah. has clarified that she is an Ethelis. Yes. And this is no, I, I, I personally, I think Amanda's a, a lovely human being. I, I, I think that she, um, 
<laughs> I think she's very creative. Um, I think sometimes, if I'm honest, she can be blinded by you know her friendship. And friendship is lovely, but a friendship of uh, in Menden um, has led her to probably not say um, give as harsh a critique. Let's be honest, uh, as she would of somebody else uh, who had perhaps said the same things that he's said. Um, and she has made statements like she wants to ethylize um, antinatalism from within, and blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, again, I'm not sure what she means by that. I, I do want a centralized, um, you know, publication on what the hell ethylism is, so we can deduce exactly what they mean by that. But given what we've said today, do, do you think, um, would you rethink about working with ethylism? I'm not talking about talking to them, like on a kind of... Uh, where they have their channel, you have your channel. I mean, doing projects with them, because uh, personally, I would, I would think twice about it going forward. In fact, um, I don't think I will do it ever do it um, until I see exactly what ethylism is in, in, in a centralized publication that has uh, 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 the name, um, whatever name Amanda wants to use uh, on it. What do you think, Mark? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Do you think that the artwork of the podcast looked good? Yeah, that was, um, I know that's life sucks. And I do think that was very good. Um, so we fantastic. worked. So and, and the music, I, I'm and the, the music. one that asked life sucks to help me out with that logo. He created an awesome logo. Mm -hmm. um, every, Ooh. a lot of people, like even my friends that even, even know what like antinatalism is, they saw the logo and they're like, wow, you look like you're part of like this, this metal band, you look really cool. Yeah. Like it's so cool. Um, yeah, a lot of people like it. He's he's an ethelist, right? Um, I look at the conversation I have with philosopher Travis Timmerman with daily negativity. Daily, I don't know if daily negativity right. is an ethelist, but he's a pro mortalist. Something I dis, I hundred percent disagree on, but I think it was a fruitful discussion. And actually, I'm very grateful that Daily Negativity came on the channel to help me out with that interview. He did a great job. Mm -hmm. um, look at the cons like look at the outcome of what uh, Amanda and I have uh, been talking about with other philosophers and other people on that podcast. Is she? Well, the outcome is. If you excuse me for a moment, the okay. outcome seems to be that ethylism is popping into conversation. Uh, when perhaps it wouldn't have otherwise. That, that's the actual outcome. Like you're getting, you, you've spoken to some major, major people, I suppose, you know, who are academically well renowned, David Benatar, you know, um, David Pierce, et cetera. And the, the word ethylism is popping into the conversation. So, in a way, it is, it is a kind of platform for ethylism. So, that is the question. Should, how do you feel about that now, in, in hindsight? Because I, I know you, I know you as an individual, I know that. You know, you, you are a caring, compassionate guy. Yeah. Does that keep you awake at night ever? Do you worry about that? Here's what I worry about is that other philosophies do not get spoken about. So, for example, um, if we were only talking about ephelism, I'd be worried about that. And But what I've seen through these conversations is that Amanda introduces it into the conversation and has a back and forth argument and counter argument. I think that is philosophically okay to do because we're talking about people that are advocating for totally different views. For example, um, I've platformed, well, I mean, like we've platformed on the podcast, uh, people who call themselves antinatalists, but will say, once we meet this type of equilibrium in the environment, it's okay to procreate at that point. We've had transhumanists on the podcast, right? Um, we've had oh, yeah. pro mortalists on the podcast. We've had uh, like we've had seven who talked about paramilitary stuff, right? Like um, yeah, like I, I don't know what that was about. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like. Uh, Am I not to work with any of these people? Am I not to have the conversations with any of these people? I don't see the objection. There's a difference. That there's a difference. There's a difference. There's a difference between you know talking across the table uh, uh, in a conversation with somebody, and you know working on a project with somebody. I, 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 
Okay, so what's you the know, harm? On the what's, same, like, what's the bad thing that's happening with that? Because the the outcome well, the bad, is the bad, we've the talked bad, about I'm, a lot of different things. Yeah, but, but listen, this conversation is good. I'm not like from from you know you 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 you've um you bring up a, a good good points, and I hope that uh, some of the Eppelus, uh you know listen to you and and you're concerned. Um, I I think that it's good to talk. <laughs> it's good to you know clarify things. Um, there's been a lot of worrying things said. That is the worry. Uh, for example, uh, we worry about what the line is for ethelism. You know, would they, do they, do they, um, given what was said about, for example, the pregnant woman being pushed down the stairs or whatever, or, or murdered, do they, um, as individuals, um, know <laughs> right from wrong? Do, do they, uh, what I mean by that is, is it, is it part of the philosophy that you should kill pregnant women? Um, is it part of the philosophy that you know they are legitimate targets? Um, I, I I I don't think it is. I hope it's not. I, I, I think it's I highly doubt not. That. I think this was just. I think it's I think it's part of their. Um, I think generally speaking, it sounds like uh, you know everybody must go rather than individuals. But again, these are things that there shouldn't be any. Um, there shouldn't be any gray areas with these types. Things. These, these, like that shouldn't be said. It should be condemned outright. Um, you know, <laughs> and again, I would condemn the ultimate goal anyway because I don't think it's uh, feasible. I, I think it's a violation of uh, uh, consent. But um, okay. anyway, we we've spoken for a long I, I, I know, but like um, you, you left me on here so, something like I really want to hear. Okay, so what I'll say is, if you have criticisms about me, I don't. I wouldn't say working with collaborating with people that I strongly disagree with no please, please email me at green rebel vegan at gmail.com and also I want to highlight that my my avatar uh with the no drama llama <laughs> is uh was also created by life sucks so um again am I like do you think that's a bad thing that I I collaborate with life sucks on um on what we've produced as well so like he created my artwork. Well, like um, he's been on yeah, my yeah. channel a couple um, of times. So, do you I, like what's, what's the bad thing? Uh, what's the life counter argument? The counter argument is that uh, you are working with, uh, but I, I'm not saying it's about life sucks. I'm not overly familiar with life sucks work. But I do think his heart, his heart is fantastic. Um, and um, the the counter argument is what is what be is what is being whispered in the corridors. And as I said, I I personally know uh, Mark from your, you know your from your um, conversations that we've had and stuff. And that you do get personally quite perturbed uh, about matters. And you know I think that you are a very caring caring gentleman. Um, yeah, I think we've gone over it really. Okay. The problem is the lack of the lack of clarity. Uh, the things that have been said, um, you know, we just need uh, a centralized message of what the hell it is, um, what the hell ethelism is. And, you know, without this fucking bullshit of saying, oh, we don't want to kill anybody. We're not about that. And then, like, you know, <laughs> a few sentences later saying, we've got the nuclear bombs. We could do it tomorrow. You know, I, I mean... <laughs> There's so much that just needs to be cleared up, and the the problem is, it, it, as of yet, it, it's not it's not clear. Um, yeah. Um, well, and that that, that to... is the kind of they're, they're kicking themselves. You know, they're they're not doing themselves any favor because it is a very controversial topic, yeah. and uh, you know, by uh, by not clarifying matters, it looks disingenuous. It looks uh, dodgy. Uh, and it looks like even they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Mm. So please clarify matters. Yeah. And uh, that's what I would suggest. And and just as my final thing, like if if anybody has any questions or doubts or whatever about my personal view um, and has like criticisms or whatever disagreements, uh, yeah, just contact me and we'll talk it out. And you're welcome to come on my channel and we can hash it out together. So it's, yeah. That's all I'd say. Um, I hope I hope we've addressed yeah. as much as we can in this conversation. I feel like we did. Well, you know, as I say, um, no offense to any of the individuals concerned. Uh, I think 
You know, they're, 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 I, I genuinely believe there's deep care and, and, and sympathy and empathy uh, for, most, for the most part for most individuals. Um, and uh, I know that a lot of them have suffered terribly in their own lives as well. Um, so I hope that uh, today's conversation, while it's been difficult because uh, like personally, I, I like some of the people, <laughs> you know, like as I said, even parts of Emenda and the old rogue, I like, you know, <laughs> sometimes he has a nice sense of humor or whatever. But as I said, we're, we're multifaceted as human beings. So we all have parts of us that work great and other parts that don't work so well. So this isn't, um, I'm not trying to dehumanize anybody or say anybody's subhuman. I'm just saying we need to look at what we're saying. We need to appreciate that none of us, none of us uh, are God. Uh, and we are, and we should all be open to uh, critique. And really and truly, I really hope that we all uh, realize we're not just rational beings. We are, we are emotive beings and we do need to think a little bit more about the emotional sensibilities of others. Um, because at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, uh, that's an important facet of conversation. Uh, I mean, people do put go on the defensive or on the attack uh, based on their emotions. So you do have to find a way of wiggling into people's heads uh, if you want to, if you want them to think about what you're saying. And you have to do that with a bit of tact. Uh, it's not an easy process, uh, but I, 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 I personally don't think it's been done very well uh, at the moment. And I know I, I, <laughs> I struggle with it myself. So it's an ongoing uh, endeavor of mine to try and find a way of uh, communicating better. Um, and I, 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 I just hope that people who are you know, more in, intellectually endowed than me can find uh, a way of, uh, you know, speaking uh, in a way that's emotively respectful. So anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm rambling again, <laughs> and uh, I want to say thank, thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Aaron, for the conversation. And, um, yeah, yeah um, and uh, yeah, good luck, peace and love, everybody. Um, as if that was possible, but, you know, I, I do wish everybody, uh, oh, as, uh, I, I wish everybody to have a good, good uh, moment of respite, and. Uh, you know, um, to stay as well as possible for as long as possible. Thank you very much. Thanks. Take care. Bye.